At Drum and Golf, we understand your passion. Nice roll. And that's because every Drum and Golf store is owned and run by a local who loves the game as much as you do. Yeah, it's come off the face really well. Someone who knows where you play and what you need. Oh yeah, looking good. With Australia's biggest range and expert knowledge. Great. Now let's try that putter with this grip. So if you want to improve your game, see your local expert at Drum and Golf. Hello and welcome to episode 124 of The Thing About Golf, Golf Australia Magazine's ongoing search for the multitude of reasons that people get hooked on this game. Rod Murray's my name and on this episode we're going to poke a bit into some big kind of golf related but not really golf related themes with a man who has become in golf at least an accidental media success story. Where, how, and who we get our information from, regardless of the topic, plays a role in what shapes our own views. And the who part of that equation is having a real shake-up at the moment. In our little golf corner of the internet, we've seen the rise of significant new players in this space in recent years, the likes of No Laying Up and The Fried Egg, several YouTube golf stars, these people all making a business out of their passion. Ryan French operates on a smaller scale. But in his own way, he's at least as successful, albeit his success really has been a happy accident. Ryan is likely better known by his Twitter name, Monday Q Info, or the associated handle, A Case of the Golf. Focusing on the lower tiers of professional golf, telling the stories of the grind for those players at that level, Ryan's gathered around him a large following, and he's parlayed that popularity into financial success. Now, don't get me wrong, Ryan is really good at what he does. And as you'll hear, encouragingly, he doesn't take his work or his position lightly. This is an interview about golf, but I think it's about something bigger as well. It's about how we navigate the public space in a social media world that whether we like it or not, we are all helping to shape. I hope you find the chat as interesting as I did. First things first, we'll start where we always do by saying thank you for taking the time, Ryan French. It's quite the commitment, the thing about golf, So, and I know that you're a busy man, so thanks for doing that. Clues in the title, what's the thing about golf for Ryan French? Yeah, um, I mean, the thing is, uh, I have become a golf nerd, and for me, the the journey to the top tours in the world is what golf is is for me. Um uh, I love it. I've covered, I've dedicated my life to it and, uh, it's still as interesting to me now as it was when I wasn't doing this. Indeed. So what I was going to ask was, of course, it didn't start for you with all oh, these underdog stories are interesting. There must be a golf connection that goes back further. So where did golf start for you and what's been your relationship with the game? Yeah. Um, it was so in- golf has been vital to me my entire life. Um, my d- my family and I grew up on uh, a golf course. We grew up on the fourth hole, third hole uh, of a local municipal course in northern Michigan. And uh, I say all the time, Rod, I definitely didn't appreciate that my dad was a CEO of a, a very small company and would come home at 5 o'clock every day starting when I was about age 8 and we would go play nine holes at night. Um, you know, I just took it for granted for sure. And we did that for most of our life uh, uh, till I left for college. Um, Were you immediately so, hooked? And what sort of level of play did you get to? Yeah, I uh, I was immediately hooked for a couple of reasons, Rod. I've told this story a few times, but I don't know if everybody knows it. But uh, when I was six years old, our TV, our family TV, uh, blew up and started on fire. <laughs> and my parents were like... We were watching a Red Wings game. The funny part of the story is we our, our TV was in the basement and our fire extinguisher was on the top floor, the third floor. <laughs> and uh, my mom, my dad yelled up to my mom to get the fire extinguisher and she couldn't lift it. So <laughs> um, anyway, it was fine. Um, and my parents were not against TV or anything like that, but they were like, oh, we'll get it fixed tomorrow and mm. we'll get it fixed next week and we'll get it fixed next month. And my parents didn't have a TV for 35 years. Uh, And so as a kid, when you're six years old, eight years old, obviously this was before tablets or the internet or anything like that. You didn't, I didn't have much to do. Uh, And so outside of hanging with friends, 
I played golf all the time to keep myself busy. Um, and so, but I did always love it. You know, uh, I love the time with my dad. Uh, I love the competition. I love the friends. And so, uh, I played small college golf. Uh, I was a scratch golfer at one time. Don't play enough anymore to, to keep that up. But, um, yeah, I've, I've always, it's always been, uh, my first love as a hobby. It's mm. just been, I, I, feel- I remember reading, Sorry. Go ahead, Brett. No, no, I was going to say, I, I feel like um, for some of us, for some golfers, it, it kind of stops at the hitting of the ball. I think these are the guys who are going to become pros, the, the joy of hitting the ball and of getting better and the perfecting the technique. Some of us find deeper stories in golf. Not all golfers do, as you would know. Some people think you and I are nuts. Golfers think you and I are nuts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the interest level that we yeah, take 100%. in the game. When did that happen for you? Uh, firstly, do you agree with the premise that there's kind of two types of golfers, those for whom the game and the score is what golf's about, and then there's others for whom there's this whole other world of courses and clubs and swing and rules. <laughs> Take your pick of the yeah. multiple elements of golf to be interested in. Do you think that's a fair breakdown, or am I being too narrow? Yes, there? 100%. And it's especially changed later in my life, but I think, Rod, going back to your, to your original question is, that started a long time ago, and it, and it really coincides with losing my TV because my parents got the Detroit Free Press, and I remember Monday mornings looking at scores in the back and wondering, you know, back in those days, the the guy who finished last on the PGA Tour made whatever, 7000 mm-hmm. you know, $8,000, and wondering, like, what does his life look like? Uh. And then I was lucky enough in high school to play with a guy named Greg Kraft. Greg won the Puerto Rico Open, uh, you know, was a grinder back and forth from the Corn Ferry Tour to the PGA Tour, lose his card, go back to the Corn Ferry Tour, be up on tour for a couple of years. And I remember playing with him at my local course. And I, you know, I, like a lot of people, thought like, oh, this guy's life is glamorous. He plays on the PGA Tour. And, you know, it isn't mm-hmm. that, right? And so uh, it is always minor leagues of any sport. The fringes of any sport have always been interesting to me. Golf has always been number one, but I'm interested in the 12th man on the Detroit Pistons or 12th guy on a rugby team or Australian news, whatever. There's always someone who is on the cusp of taking care of his life or or not living out his dream at all. Uh, so it was started at a very young age, for sure. Yeah, indeed. Uh, because I, I think that comes later for most. I think most of us start with the hitting of the ball, but then there's a point where yep. some of us realize we're not going to be very good at that. What about these people that are? They're interesting, aren't they? And how do they get there? Uh, of course, you're right. The, the public view of golf, both among golfers and non-golfers, I think, is that you know if you're a professional golfer, if you're introduced to a professional golfer, you assume they have a jet. Yes. You, most <laughs> most casual golf fans could probably name all of the guys on the PGA Tour who have their own jet, couldn't they? There's not many. There's a lot of them have got yeah. shares, timeshares in those private jets, but not many have one right. parked in the garage. Where do you reckon that comes from? Has golf made a mistake with its public image? And this crosses over into other parts of golf, and I particularly always link this to the public golf discussions that we have in Australia. Here, lots and lots of people are saying, why have we got these public golf courses? They should be parks. They're reserved for the few, yep. that sort of thing. That's partly linked, I think, to that image of if you're a professional golfer, you own your own jet. Do we do enough in yeah. golf to dispel that? No. I mean, that that's the short answer. We push this, and it's obviously, as you know, Rod, has gotten worse over the last two years, right? We live glamorized, making you know $4 million for a win and 500000 or 50000 for last. And the PGA Tour has latched onto that. And we were talking all the time about the millions and millions of dollars that Scotty Scheffler has won or Max Homa or Xander Schauffele or whoever. And that is, as golf nerds, we I tend to not realize how the casual van, fan views golf. That's what they see. That's all they see, yeah. right? Yeah. That's all they care to see is uh, they're going to watch Sunday uh, on majors, maybe Sunday on important PGA Tour events or PGA Tour events in general, uh, and that's all they talk about on the broadcast. They don't talk about the guy. You know, I push it often is like the guy who is about to finish tenth or who has a putt to finish t ten, so he gets into next week's event. 
that putt is way more important than Rory McIlroy winning the, you know, the Another US Memorial Open. Yeah, or, or the Memorial or whatever. whatever. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Whatever it is, right? Yeah. yeah. So, like, and I think it it spills over to even casual golf. I think a lot of casual people look at golf as like, oh, it's all these people that belong to these ritzy country clubs and all of those things where – the fact is, a large portion of us, I play at a little municipal course, and that's where 90% of golfers play, is a course that costs $50, the, gra- the greens aren't perfect, hmm. the people are regular blue-collar people. Uh, I think that pro golf bleeds into the perception of golf in general. Uh, and and it hurts the game. I, I, think, I think the popularity of my account proves that people had no idea that this world even existed. Uh, and the fact is, 95% of pro golfers, or whatever that percentage is, a large percentage, mm-hmm. 90% or greater, uh, live paycheck to paycheck or mm-hmm. with the help of others or Maxed whatever to make ends and, meet. Yeah, it's a, yeah exactly. It, it, it's all of that. That's sort of real golf, what you've described there. And I was a member of a similar club myself, the only club I've ever been a member of, little club with, you know, panel beaters and butchers and electricians were the members. You know, they were real people. And it was yeah. fantastic. There's nothing rich about it. But the thing I noticed about that amongst those goals, many of them probably couldn't have identified Jordan Spieth 10 years ago if he'd walked mm-hmm. onto the golf course. The golfers themselves don't care about professional golf. Lots of them. They couldn't, you know, they couldn't pick yep. Greg Craft out of a lineup. I'd probably struggle even though I'm familiar with his name. So there's this weird disconnect, isn't there, between golf, professional golf, and how the outside world views golf. I wanted to come to something. Your story, Ryan, to me is as interesting as much as an accidental media success story as anything else. And this intrigues me because my background is media. I'm a journo by trade. You know, I was a daily newspaper hack. So the media as a topic, and particularly now with social media and the way media looks now, always fascinates me. Is that a fair assessment? Are you a, an accidental media success story, or was this always the plan? Is, is there a moustache-twirling Rupert Murdoch within Ryan French that none of us have seen yet that's, that's working on building this empire? <laughs> uh, Rod, I wish I was that smart. I'd like <laughs> to take credit that I had this great idea. Uh, I would love to say that I you know, sat home and said, oh, there's a niche that there's no one's There's a gap in the market. Doing. I've spotted no. it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Like, if I was that smart, I would have done things a lot differently. So, uh, no, I, I mean... As people who follow me know, I'm not a great writer. I'm an okay storyteller. I'm, a, I'm pretty proud of my reporting. Uh, but there was this was completely accidental. My son had brain surgery. I left the restaurant business. I've never written outside of college a paper article in my entire life. Uh, I've never done anything journalistic before outside of reading. Um, now, looking back, as we just talked about, yes, I filled a niche that no one was talking about. No one was... <laughs> As I often say, no one was stupid enough to <laughs> do this, try to do this for a living. Uh, so, um, no, there is no – I figure it out day by day. Um, I, I wish I had some sort of plan, uh, evil plan to fill this niche. But, <laughs> yes, I think, I think uh, you know, the pop, looking backwards, Rod, why it became popular is, A, no one was covering it, B – no one knew. A lot of people didn't know about it. And C, I think, as we just talked about, golf needed it. And that's not to pack myself on the back. That's to say we don't tell enough of these stories. Whether it's on golf.com or Golf Digest or anything, we're not telling enough of the stories that make golf relatable to regular people in Alpena, Michigan or Australia or wherever that can relate. They cannot relate to Scotty Scheffler. They can't relate to, they can relate to, you know, a guy trying to keep his card and understanding that he will lose his job if he doesn't. Uh, They've been there or they wanted to be there or they have a similar, similar story in their life. Something Uh, resonates, doesn't it? That's real, isn't it? Scotty Scheffler flying private plane is not real. Most of us are never going to live that. The money is monopoly money. You, you, if you stop to think about the sorts of sums we throw around that golfers make, if you think about yeah. those sums of money, it's just – it's a different world to us. It's, it's un, uh, unrelated. Yeah, I mean, I read, a, I read a tweet today. Like, there's – I think Scotty Scheffler made some bonus or something like that. Like, 
you know, he's at thirty-six million dollars for a year. Who can relate to that? It's August. You know, a tiny, tiny person. <laughs> it's person August, Ryan. Like, <laughs> it's yes, August. Yes, yeah, he's still got the richest <laughs> part of the schedule coming <laughs> yeah, up. The and he might just win the FedEx Cup, and that'll be another ten million. There's something sort yeah. of. That. It feels to me like the key to this, in the media sense, for you has been, and it's part of that accidental thing. I find the word somewhat sort of annoying. It's kind of not it hasn't been weaponized, but it's it, it's become a bit cliche. There's an authenticity about how you started. Leaving aside, and we don't have time to discuss that here today. But leaving aside the trauma of your two year old son having to have brain surgery and you needing to take time off work to be able to help care for him. There's a podcast episode in that unrelated to golf. You kind of just started this during that time, didn't you? It was like something to fill time. You thought you'd grab a Twitter handle and start telling stories about blokes who are trying to yeah. make it. Rod, I say this all the time, is if I made a list of the craziest things that were going to happen on the first day that I started this Twitter handle, none of the things that have actually happened would have been on that list because they would have been too far-fetched. I'm telling you and the people listening, I had zero, zero intention it would ever be a thing never thought i would thought 100 followers would have been i I remember getting to a thousand and calling my wife at work and saying i've got to a thousand followers like thousand might as well been a million like Mm. i didn't think anyone would care and again even at a thousand i never thought oh i can turn this into a thing or that was never the intention it was just like i can't believe a thousand people are interested and hearing about Monday qualifying. How long did so, that take, Rob, uh, to get to a thousand? How long did it take for people to start to discover you? Because we know the viral nature of yeah, social media. I, I remember, Rod. That I don't remember the particular story, but I remember the the first idea was just to have a links to Monday qualifying scoreboards. They're played at different sections all over the world. So, and then I remember kind of transitioning to telling, you know. Steve Allen story, like, oh, he hasn't had status since 2011. He's played in, you know, 75 Monday qualifiers and got through and will play in his first PGA Tour event in eight years or whatever. And people going, like, what? Either A, don't know who Steve Allen is, or B, didn't know Steve Allen still played, or C, kind of remember Steve Allen from somewhere else or when he was, you know, top 75 in the world and they went, whoa, I didn't even know this world existed. Or Aaron Baddeley was a great one, right? Like, they didn't know Aaron. (laughs) Like, they thought you won five times on the PGA Tour, and you're like, just go and play on the PGA Tour for the rest of the year. That's right, yeah. Yeah, right. So that was the transition. A 1,000 maybe took me six months, and then it happened pretty quickly after that. I always tell the story of, like, my aha moment of, like, oh, my God, people are genuinely interested. It was the Honda classic monday qualifier uh prior to them changing the the um the schedule it was the super bowl of mondays and uh it had a great field always has a huge field or it did back in those days and the playoff always goes to tuesday morning and tuesday morning the south florida pj section was sending me updates shot by shot you know just like i remember uh sang moon bay was in it and so and so was in i was just literally taking their text and going, San Bay has 10 feet for birdie and, you know, whatever. And I'm sure looking back, it wasn't as many as I thought it was, but it felt like a million people were watching it. They were responding. And my kids had to go to school. I was going to take my kids to school. And I, I remember writing a tweet that said, should my kids be late for school and I keep reporting this playoff, or should I, you know, take my kids to school on time? And everybody replied, like, you got to stay, you got to stay. And I very <laughs> I don't, literally... That's right, I need the school to get your kids. kids. They can learn to read later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, man, this is... So I really very well did... Uh, didn't take my kids to school for a half an hour, 40 minutes late, and just kept reporting the, mm-hmm. the Monday qualifier. And I was like, man, this is... This is a thing. And that was the first time for sure that I was like, can this? I don't even know. Like, what's a journalist? Is, is this media? Is this what we're of, doing here? Am I media now? Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Well, but you are. It and took me years to even <laughs> – go ahead, Rod. Yeah. You are. And it's an interesting way for it to happen. So I'm intrigued by this notion that the South Florida PGA have looked around and said, how do we get these scores out? You know, Who do we send? They could have sent them to Golf Week. Golf died. They could have sent them to us here mm-hmm. in golf. All of us would have been free to do what you did. None of us saw that 
area of interest. So you've got two things at play. You've got a an audience, albeit probably quite small in the grand scheme of things, who wants this information, mm-hmm. and which is very hard to find. And now you've got a conduit for people to be able to get that information, and the people with the information mm-hmm. are on board with it. So that relationship, that triangle relationship is kind of perfect. Media gets off the rails. We know that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Once you get into the commercial thing and then agendas change, but when you're just doing those updates, that's your very raw, natural thing. So there's two things that play there. One, you've got a natural eye for a good story, clearly. There was a journo within you, whether you knew it or not. <laughs> Lots of people do, and most people just don't ever think about journals. But that's the basic job of a reporter. Look at a list of information, scores, and see a story beyond that. Steve Allen one's great. Steve Allen still looks 12 years old. Was he 51 now, 52? He still looks 12 years mm-hmm. old, yeah. one of the good people in golf. Yeah. So that that natural attraction to the story and that others are interested in that story, but that connection with the people who've got the information, the gatekeepers, that's really, really interesting. And you would have seen since that time how that works with things like sponsors. So instead of it being South Florida PGA wanting to get information out about an event – now the sponsor thinks, well, where's a good conduit for me to get to the audience I want to get to? And they sort of pick you. Have you thought about any of that? I know it's unfolded just organically and you've waded through yeah. it best you can. Have you thought about that and how that relationship works? Because you are, in fact, that makes you – that's what Rupert Murdoch is on a grand scale. Yeah. What I've really struggled with, Rod, is is f- keeping my independence as a media – and. It, it's so weird to even say that mm-hmm. because we're at we're still talking about a point where I don't even I didn't even consider myself media or anything like that. Um, but yes, I've thought about that how to get there and how to remain truly independent as well as media can is my goal. And so me, business connections, I am very much, Dunning and uh, Golf Tech, Red Roost are all companies that have come to me. I've never reached out to a company. I'm sure I'm costing myself lots of money by doing that. Uh, I hate asking for things, so uh, I hate selling myself. Um, but yes, the, there there has to be a way that I can go to Cognizant, which is now the, the Honda sponsor, and go, hey, you have one of the best Mondays of the year. Let's Can do, we do something. something. Uh, I've never, never got there. Yeah, that's sort of really interesting, isn't it? It's a uh, yeah because of, yeah, you so, see, of course, how that yeah, commercial that, interest starts to skew things. And this is all media, yeah, not just golf. Golf's 100%. interesting to see because you're interested in the topic, and so then you have a bit more of an understanding of the nuances of yep. the industry itself. But this is how media works broadly. And these questions these are the questions publishers face because your basic problem, Ryan, you've got two customer bases. You've got a sponsor who pays your mortgage or your rent and your food and all that. But you've got the reader who expects you to be able to put that aside. The difference with what you're doing with what yep. Murdoch does is when I worked for News Limited all those years ago, you had an advertising sales department and you had a newsroom. And the two never spoke to each other at all. At the top level, the editor spoke to the advertising. Center, but, but as journalists, you felt like you were just operating free of that whole advertising environment. You've got yep. that opposite. Problem. You are the man in the middle. You got an up close peek at commercial media. You worked at Fire Pit Stories or the Fire Pit Collective, which now unfortunately is no longer with us. So, two things about that. What did you learn about some of those things we're talking about with the media and how that works and how it can skew things uh, around? And yeah. two, you also got to work with two really highly respected journos, Michael Bamberger and Alan Shipnuck. So, first about that commercial relationship and what you've learned from that and what that might uh, inform you going forward. And second, you've really picked. Uh, those of us who've known you for a while have watched how much you've learned, I think particularly from Michael Bamberger, who is one of the very best in the yeah. business. So commercial first, and then yeah. tell us about working the, with Bamberger. Yeah, the commercial side, right, again, just how naive I was going into this, uh, and, and this is to media in general, but especially in golf. I was like, golf is a sport. It's really meaningless in the scheme of our everyday lives. Just tell a damn story. Like, if there's a story to tell, just tell it. Good, bad, indifferent, just tell the truth. Uh, and so go to Fire Pit, and you have sponsors that are paying large amount of money to do that. It's not that easy. Uh, oh, this guy cheated, and you want to tell a story? Well, he has a relationship with so-and-so who has a relationship with 
this company who's sponsoring you is that a story you want to tell and you're like whoa like and this agent is, you know oversees this player but also this player who's been very helpful to you and has been open and on your show and has given you information and all of the and you're like oh no like I, i'm not sure i can tell that story uh and so the commercial side has been the hardest for me to navigate because i just and again i think it's me being naive i was just like oh i'm just gonna tell stories good bad indifferent uh I'll just tell stories and it's, and it's not that simple, unfortunately. Uh, you know, there was times at fire pit that I would tweet out something and Matt would call me and say, <laughs> what have you, oh, done? you can't, you know, you can't say that. And I would be like, what? I didn't even, you know, I didn't say anything like, but it's, it's just not that easy. Uh, behind the scenes you have the PJ tour is difficult on journalists. Quite frankly, they're, they make phone calls to you and they idle threats and can, they took our, uh, they took our media credentials at fire pit for, for over a year. Yeah. They didn't take them. They just say, Oh, we, well, we, you know, we're out at yeah. the tour championship. We don't have enough space or whatever. Um, and so it, it is highly complicated. Uh, I just wrote a story about a guy who allegedly cheated in a mini tour event, he was just signed by a company that I work with. I didn't know that. Uh, but you do now. And it hasn't affected, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it hasn't affected, it hasn't affected my relationship. They didn't bring it up. Someone else brought it up to me, but I was like, Oh my God. Like, but I don't want to ever let that, uh, prevent me from writing a story. And, but that's easy to say after I wrote it, not knowing. Right. Had I known that before, would I still have written it? I hope so. I hope I'd, I'd like to say myself, yes. I also have a mortgage to pay. Yeah. Uh, so, so the, so the, the, the commercial side has been complicated and I know nothing about it. And probably the best way to be, to be honest with you, Ron, <laughs> the less you know, about sorry, it, the less you know about it is yeah. probably the better. That's 100%. the best, the better way to be too. Yes. And I think it's a different uh, thing when those sponsors have found you, though, as well. That's a different relation to what I think we see in traditional media. Yeah. Podcasting is my business, and I'm from doing the golf stuff. And and that's what I think of podcasting as. It's this. It's an interesting way for information to be shared. You know the feeling when your mate's golf ball flies past yours? Or when you're on the green in regulation, but he holds it from the bunker? At Drummond Golf, we get it. That's why we have our lowest price guarantee. As Australia's biggest, you can count on our massive buying power for the lowest prices in golf. But if you do happen to find a lower advertised price, we'll beat it. The Drummond Golf lowest price guarantee. Unbeatable. Conditions apply. And as far as as Michael and Alan, Michael Bamberger um, is by far the best thing that happened to me at Fire Pit. uh, And quite frankly, has been one of the best things uh, to happen in my life outside of my family. Um, He's an amazing human being. He is one of the best writers we know, and he calls me all the time. Now, I did a book with him. It's very open and honest about my mental health struggles and all of those things. Um, But we spent hours and hours on that book. Uh, It taught me so many things about writing. I mean, he spent the the part in the book about me is whatever, 70 pages or 80 pages. We spent hundreds of hours on the phone. And, you know, this is a guy that is asking me what color my grandpa grandfather's house was. Uh, and I'd say gray. Well, what color gray? You know, dark gray. Mm-hmm. Okay, where was the house? Describe the basement. And that was one line in a book that is 250 pages. But it was so. a good line, wasn't it? Um, and you read the line. Yeah. And it fits in the story. Well, this is exactly. this is this is about writing. So so in many ways journalism is just a trade like being a plumber or an electrician. There are a certain set of skills that you learn and one he's teaching you there about being a better reporter on it is detail. The more detail you can say about any given thing, the better it reads and the more interesting it is to read. So that's it's an interesting sort of lesson that you've got to have the idea for the, the narrative and then you've got to be able to 
make it interesting to read. The writing itself, people think about journalists, they think about writing. It's not really what it is, is it? It's a people skill, reporting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but he's taught me right about everything, right? I mean, a, a simple thing, I'll give away one of Michael's secrets is that he taught me that has gotten me so many good quotes and so many additional good stories is, Ryan, just let the silence hang for a couple of seconds after every question, right? And they'll feel awkward mm -hmm. and they'll fill it in with something. Mm -hmm. uh, and Often something they didn't so want to. Many. <laughs> Often something they didn't want right. to, which is the yeah. best story. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so, Michael and I talk often. Any big story, I say, "Hey, what is this?" You know, I wrote a story right after about my own mental health. Right after Grayson Murray uh, took his own life, um, and the the first person I called, the only person I called for advice was Michael. And I said, "Hey, Michael, I don't want to make this about me." That's not that's not the goal here, but I have an inside knowledge about what Grayson has gone through in some respects, and I think it's an important time for us to listen. Do you think it's right? And he, you know, he gave me his opinion and said, "Yeah, it's not only right; it's perfect." But if he had said no, I wouldn't have written it. Mm -hmm. uh, and he he came up just this weekend to caddy for me in my city open. Drove 13 hours. His flight was canceled. Drove from Philadelphia uh, Friday night to get here to caddy for me Saturday and Sunday. This is one of the greatest golf riders of our time coming to Alpena, Michigan, which is in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. uh, to caddy for me. And all of it is life and writing advice. It's never – if you're – with I'm with Michael, I try to soak up as much as I possibly can about anything. Uh, one of the greatest humans I've ever met and – beyond lucky to call him a friend. Hmm. What you mentioned there with Grayson Murray, that's the other moral conundrum. Once you have a platform, which you do now, you got to 1,000 followers, now you're at 172,000, you have sponsors, and this is a genuine small business, I'm going to guess. I don't think you're living in a moated castle there, are you, with grounds and stuff? I don't think it's yeah. returning that sort of stuff <laughs> just yet. But with that comes the other side of that. You now have a platform. And some responsibility. What yeah. do you say to your followers and what topics do you talk about? These are genuine questions, aren't they, that not all media asks itself, I don't think. But if you're in the – what you're doing is proper reporting. You write the hard stories about players having cheated. Players now contact you because they know you have the platform. They think they've got a story mm -hmm. to tell. How are you navigating all of that? Because – there's no right or wrong answers most of the time, but I imagine yeah. that does weigh on you in some ways. A hundred percent. You know, I've I've covered a lot of. Well, let's just let's t take the mental health side. Uh, you know, for a long time, outside of my family, I didn't tell anybody about the fact that so I tell, attempted tell us, suicide. Yeah, yeah, tell us t tell us yeah. a little bit about that story, for, just for background. Sure. So know. Yeah. 15 years ago, drank too much, womanized too much, gambled too much, uh, worked too hard, didn't care about anything besides myself. And inside, I was kind of struggling. Not kind of. I was struggling and uh, attempted to take my own life um, in Las Vegas 15 years ago. Uh, luckily, I always joke that, that this is very literally why the windows don't open in Las Vegas hotel rooms. Um, and then... I, I told that story in Michael's book and the the support has been overwhelming. I think it's important. And it was also very freeing for me, Rod, is like uh It's not a secret anymore. It wasn't a secret, it wasn't a, anything, but it was very freeing to just be who I am. Like, hey, I wasn't perfect. I struggled. Uh having that book out was just very freeing. So writing the Grace and Murray story was it scary? Of course, because not many people have read the book, you know, in the scheme of things. And so writing it is scary, but also I thought it was golf is back to what we talked about earlier, this insulated and everybody's wealthy and okay and fine. And we're not, we're not all fine. And we're Grayson, the PGA tour winner has come back, you know, and he wasn't okay. Uh, 
And so I thought it was an important time to write it. With my platform, I've ever since that book has come out, I've really tried to focus on just telling who I am. If the topic is marital or golf or mental health, then I have a platform to tell it. Um, and uh, go ahead, Rob. Sorry. You are very open with that stuff. Anybody who follows your Twitter feed will see not quite equal amounts, but there's plenty of discussion about your marriage and your kids and living near your mum and all that other stuff that's got nothing to do with people trying to Monday qualify. Do you wrestle with that at all? How do you feel about that? Because you, that's a vulnerable place to be in some ways, isn't it? There's lots of people all over the world who know, I know that you live in Alpena. I couldn't find it. I couldn't point to it on a map, but if I had to come and find yep. you – I could. Do you wrestle with that at all? I spoke to Megan McLaren about this, and there's a fine line, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, I don't wrestle with it as much, Rod, except for I wrestle with the people who I share their life That's right. with, right? My wife, my kids, you know, I don't want people making fun of my kids or saying something about my wife or whatever, and that very, very rarely happens. I also have to be very aware that they didn't ask to have mm -hmm. this public life of any sort. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 100% a, a balance. Uh, for those that follow my account, Benny is a great example. Benny is an Alpina guy who has kind of struggled in his own life. But we often have serious conversations in the car of like, Benny, you like you cannot be a part of this at all. You don't have to be. I'm not. I'm not asking you to be a part of it. We can scrap all of this. So you, you have to be very aware of other people's lives that get swooped up in. I, I don't mind sharing mine. Again, when you share the lowest moment in your life, other things kind of, mm -hmm. they don't, not that they don't matter, but when you've shared the lowest point of your life, it's easy to share other parts yeah. of your life. Yeah. I, I, but there's other people that get swooped up in it. Yeah. You can see how someone with a different mindset, you can start to see how people can see – media is particularly guilty of this, perhaps not specific journos, but this is what media does. Find people to latch on to who give you the results. Princess Di was a classic example. Mm. People bought magazines when she was on the cover. All those scandals and all that paparazzi stuff. A friend of mine worked at a magazine here in Australia called Who Weekly when – Princess Di died, and who had had Princess Di on the cover, like a lot of those gossip mags, for years, and they sold really well. Within a day of her dying, they were getting sacks of death threats <laughs> and accusations of, look what you've done to her, from the very people who bought the magazine. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> those people who yep. drove that supply demand. So you can see how easy it would be if you're in that publishing industry. Latch on to those who make you money it almost dehumanizes them, doesn't it? I'm not suggesting that for you, but you can see from where you are how easy that could be. You know, Benny's a good character. The people like him. I'll keep writing about Benny. You've got to sell what, yep. buy, what uh, people I mean, buy. I, I mean, Rod, I, I think about this often when I write cheating allegations, right, is I take those very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the effect those stories are going to have on a young person's career life. Mm -hmm. I wrote a couple stories that have ended players' careers. That is a huge responsibility, and I take no joy in it. It's also my job because they've affected other people's lives, the very lives of the people I cover. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I don't get scared that that person is going to, you know, have a mental breakdown or, uh, you know, whatever the case may be like i am affecting people's lives mm. that is a great responsibility to to take on uh it also goes back to my relationship with michael is you know hey michael here's what i have on this guy you know have i done have i done everything i need to do to make sure that i'm fair to this guy or girl or whatever um and so yeah, it's a, it's a that platform. I think for a long time, Rod, I was like, "Oh, I have a platform. That's great. It's wonderful. I can do good things." It mm -hmm. also comes with a huge responsibility that not everyone I have to realizes. Be very, very careful of. Not everyone realizes that people who do develop a big platform, influencers, and those kind of, many of them don't consider these sorts of questions, and that can end 
uh, quite badly. I would assume that you also, Ryan, have that understanding. You get an allegation about a player cheating and it's not to look like that's happened. There's a reason for that too, isn't it? That player too has a story. We don't know where they are in life, what might have been the motivations. John Paramore, who only passed recently, was the rules official on the European Tour for a long time. And he told me the couple of times they had actually caught people cheating were among the saddest things he'd ever seen, that, that, yeah. that, that good golfers could be driven to that because of what yeah. the professional lifestyle that you report on wears on people. No money, max yeah. out credit cards, borrowed everything you can from family, and you've just missed the cut. This was your only hope of starting to claw a life back, and you know you missed a three foot punt, and you can see some of those motivations, can't you? Yeah, I mean, I'll use Justin Doden as an example. Justin, I wrote an article about him, and he admitted it in a tweet. Um, he was on the Canadian Tour on the last hole, hit in the water, made seven, wrote a five uh, in scoring. Um, and obviously the, a lot of stories I've written about el cheating allegations, I get a ton of private messages that confirm that leading up to this, those happened. Justin was the outlier. I got messages about, Hey, this is a great dude. And he hasn't, I've never heard of anything like that. And I text Justin when the story, you know, to give him a chance. And, and I just said, Hey, Justin, if there's something going on in your life, like, let's just talk about it, man. Like, I don't want to put out something. It was obviously a move of some sort of desperation. And I'd love for that person, Justin, or other players I've written about, come out and say, hey, Ryan, here's where I was. This is what happened. This is why I did it. And I think it it would touch a ton of players' lives because there's a ton of players Let's say, I don't know this, but let's say Justin did it because of financial reasons mm -hmm. and he was desperate and he had a sponsor that was, you know, about to bail on him and he was out of money. Like, there's tons of players in that position mm -hmm. and he he could make that, plat, you know, he could make this into a positive as it can be. So, um, yeah, I, I have, that is the scariest thing about having a large platform. Mm -hmm. It comes with a great responsibility. And you know you're not always going to get it right. You try. Right. You know you're not always 100%. going to get it right. At some point, you're, gonna, you're going to, uh, to, to to make a mistake. Yeah. I, I wrote a story about a, a player at, that got DQ'd at, at the first stage of Q school, and I didn't give a player in his group enough time to respond. I was so – like, I got to get this story get out. Story out. That's the journal, isn't it? You got to be first. You got to be right? first. You got to be first. Yes, yeah, I got to be first. And – I wrote it and I didn't give the guy enough time to respond. Like they're at Q school. This isn't his like first responsibility to call me and answer no. questions about yeah, something. Of course. And, and so in, and, and a, a college coach who was, you know, his, uh, his player called me out on it and he was a hundred percent right. Like he had every right. And I just said, yeah, you're right. And from now this Listen, latest story I wrote is just like, I got to take my time here. Let's get this 100% right, give people a chance to respond, give everyone the thing. And it and it goes back to once that story's out there, because I have a large platform, people, a lot of people take it as the truth. Yep. And that needs to be make sure I have 100% yep. truth. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the social contract, isn't it? People who yep. come to you because they think they can trust you. And so it's important yep. when you make a mistake, you own up to it. So people, yep. I think it's the appeal of Rory in some ways. He makes loads of mistakes, but he generally owns up to it. And so yep. you feel like there's something uh, resonant. Just on a quick side note, how, how, how much cheating is there in professional golf? It's always been my feeling that very little. You get weeded out pretty – if you need to cheat to compete for a start, <laughs> you're not going to last all that long. It's pretty rare, though. It's not to say that it doesn't happen. But it's pretty rare, though, isn't it? Cheating in professional golf. I think in mainstream professional golf, very little, Rod. But I think what I'm learning is a lot of that is just opportunity based, uh, because in the mini tour world, there. Now, to be fair, there's tons of mini tour events <laughs> played. And I'm hearing a very – so it's still a very tiny yeah. percentage of all golf played. Uh, but the fact is at Monday qualifiers and at many tour events, it's easy to cheat or easier to cheat. 
uh, you don't have officials, you don't have crowds, you don't have caddies. It's often three guys, and if someone hits it way right and you hit it way left, and he says he found his ball, yeah, no, you don't know if he really found his ball. So uh, there has to be some inherent trust uh, there. Um, that being said, I think the culture of cheating, I get a lot. So my rule, Rod, is if you are accusing someone of cheating and I can report it that it seems there there is at least some smoke, you have to put your name on it. Yeah. Uh, I get lots of stories of, hey, Ryan, so-and-so did this and so-and-so did that, but I'm not going to talk about it. Well, yeah. I'm not putting <laughs> Don't guys Don't talk about it. That's right. <laughs> right. So, like, okay, great. So, um now, the culture of golf is you don't – a lot of people just bury that stuff. Uh, so when players are willing to put their name on it, that means it's often, you know, that that guy's putting his reputation on the line too. So, um, yeah, in the scheme of things, very, very, very small percentage. But it's definitely happening. And more than we would like. But more than we would like. Yes, more than we geez. would love to think. Is, exactly. is, is. Now, to be fair, I just wrote a story, or a tweet, not a story, about Joe Weiler from uh, on the Corn Ferry Tour, which for those that are listening, there isn't a lot of fans there either. Mm. Uh, lost his, got married, lost his uncle two days later unexpectedly, was at the Corn Ferry event that following week tied for the lead, uh, far down the points list, needed a good finish, moved some debris around his ball, and the ball moved. No one saw it. No one would ever know it. And he called it on himself and finished 10th. I mean, vastly affecting his own career. Hmm. Uh, so I think there's a lot of those stories too. More of uh, those, I think. Yeah. I think that it's, it's the great Bobby Jones lines. You might as well congratulate yeah. a man for not robbing a bank. There's a real reason. It's one of the appeals of golf, I think, for those of us who are – naive enough to believe that that's how everybody thinks about the game. But that's one of the opinions. You, you're cheating yourself, ultimately. Not in professional golf, of course, but you're cheating yourself, ultimately, if you if you do that sort of thing. Is this a bit of a runaway bucking bronco, this media? I'm more interested in the media side of what you're doing, which is, I think, the thing that you're less interested in in some ways, and it's more of a headache. No, no, I'm, I love this conversation. Than, than the golf side of it, because what we're doing here with podcasting is an interesting form of it. Media has changed so much both for good and bad. You couldn't say definitively social media has been a bad thing, but you couldn't say social media has been a good thing either. Mm -hmm. I think about yourself, and Garrett Morrison is the other one who particularly strikes me from the fried egg. We may never have heard your voices if you'd both been born 20 years earlier. That access to distribution has changed the world, has it not? Yeah. I mean uh – I had this conversation with Michael yesterday, right? It's like people, social media has given a voice to to anyone yeah. and everyone. S- sadly, and it's sadly of, in so many ways, but yes, 100%. 100%. <laughs> and, it's, and it's sadly stifled some great voices. Michael doesn't do social media. And so Michael's one of the greatest writers of our time. But if you talk to a lot of 30-year-olds, they wouldn't know who he is. Um, so, yes. So, uh, but I, I think it's great from the standpoint of it gives a lot of people different perspectives. Um, there's no doubt I would never be here if it wasn't for social media. I also understand it gives a voice to a lot of people that shouldn't have a voice. <laughs> And also, not everyone likes my voice, and that's okay. Hmm. Uh, and I'm not a great writer, so I understand people's frustration with my growing popularity as a as a you know a media person, despite the fact that I have the grammar of a, a seven year old. <laughs> so, like seven year old, that's missed it. a lot of school, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think Michigan State is probably embarrassed that I have a degree from there. (laughs) Have you now set up your keyboard to insert the errors because it's become a real become a real part of your cult personality, hasn't it? It's the I wish that's what the funny part is, Rod. Is I wish now often I'm kind of a one man show. Mark writes for me, but nothing Mark does helps or hurts what I'm doing. He just does his own thing for us. Now we talk a lot and those kind of things, and he's been amazing. But often I'm. 
on the computer while typing a tweet, while talking to somebody or looking something up, and I'm terrible at going back. So I wish that I was inserting them on purpose. That would give me an excuse, but oh, it's, I'm it's sure, often not. I'm sure Bamberg has told you this plenty of times. You never touch the send button until you've read it at least three times. <laughs> I know. At least three I know. times. Because if you've missed a I mistake know. three times, you're never going to pick it up, so it's going yeah. anyway, but you'll be surprised what you what you pick Fair. up. It's obviously been a lot of fun at this point, but do you have a look to the future? Do you think you know where this is going to go? Have you started to develop? Have you started to twirl your mustache and come up with the plan to become an evil media empire owner? What do you want to about? I've, I've, I've often thought that the internet changed media in this way. The landscape at some point, we're not there yet, but we're starting to see it, and you're a prime example will look much more like the cafe business here in Australia. Cafes everywhere here. Small businesses run by one or two people. That's their entire sort of livelihood. And people will find the cafes they like in terms of media and they'll support them directly and there'll be a bit of sponsorship on the side as well. Are we starting to see that, do you think? Are you a part of that? I I hope so, Rod. I mean, uh, twirling my mustache with with you know some sort of business plan and those kind of things – no, outside of us in, in golf and Mark and I, we're going to do more video. Mm-hmm. We're need to dive deeper into Mark's career and what he does and what he goes through. Like we're just going to expand the storytelling that we're telling, that we're doing more video, more podcasts, more stories, whatever. Uh, but I think in my dream world, and if if I could twist my mustache and find some, what I think. I got a call from uh, a beat writer of an NBA basketball team who follows me and said, Ryan, I've written more articles about the guy on the end of the bench than I ever have. And partly because the interest that people have shown in yours, Mm -hmm. right? I think in a, if there is this, a bigger media company to be had, it's covering what I cover in golf in all sports. Uh, There's a guy that gets cut on the Orlando magic and goes back to the minor leagues of basketball and gets a 10-day contract here and goes there. And those are relatable to a lot of people. It's not on the horizon. It's not been thought of outside of, I think there's some interest there. But if we could do one sport at a time uh, and find the person as much as I love golf that loves basketball Mm -hmm. and the 12th guy, I think we could make it a multi-sport thing. But (laughs) <laughs> back to Rod. I know there's a person out there like me in the basketball world. Yeah. Is he stupid enough to try to make this into a living? Yeah, well, you know, maybe. There's a there's a noble authenticity about that. I like that idea. I like the idea, too, that you get away from golf. But one of the things, having the podcast studio here as a business for me, which is a much bigger part of my business yeah. than the golf writing and stuff these days, yeah. it really gives you a fabulous better perspective on golf as well, I think. We get immersed in golf. We have our own language. We have our own media. We have our own magazines. In America, you've got your own TV channel, 24 7. Easy to get lost in that and lose perspective about golf, I think. It's been interesting to watch the live thing unfold from my perspective, not being in there on a day to day basis, writing about it. I was at the time and it's sort of on a weekly basis, but gives an interesting perspective because we can get lost in golf, can't we? And, and, and not see the world clearly because we're looking from inside the golf bubble out. We never go out and look in. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and those are, I think, back to our conversation about the money and all. The, I think it's easy for us to just worry about what Liv is doing, what PGA is doing, instead of like let's take a like step back and and what does this all mean, you know, to us and to uh, golf in general and the world in general. What's the importance of professional golf in your mind versus? And I've come much more. And when you work in the day-to-day news business of golf, professional golf is hugely important because it's content. <laughs> it's easy content to find yeah. and you can write about it every day and it's good. And in that sense, I understand it. But I've come more and more and more to the notion that I'm much less interested in professional golf than I am in the health of the game at the grassroots level, which is what holds the entire pyramid up. I think professional golf's lost that connection. They've lost touch with the notion that they've got to have some relationship with the rest of us down here. Where do you stand on that? You're immersed in professional golf, obviously. What about is is professional yeah. golf good for golf generally? I I don't think golf now is good for golf generally. I, I think the perception of golf uh, is 
not very good in the public eye right now. I think a lot of people are burned out. A good friend of my friend of mine, Chris, used to run a Ed Lore Tracker uh, account. Uh-huh. You know that is that is nerdy. That is a golf nerd. Hey, hey, as you, we all miss Ed Lore, Ryan. Do not be get the, get his <laughs> name out of your mouth on my podcast. Yes, uh, I mean we're talking about a person who was dedicated enough to have a parody account to joke around, right? And he worked at it. You know, it was all joking, but he worked at it. Yeah. Like he had a relationship with Edward, and he had a relationship with his family members, and those kind of things. That guy is only watching golf four times a year, basically, really? right? Yeah. And this is a guy who was locked into corn fairy events, yeah. right? Uh, and so, but he still plays the game and loves the game, and so he separated those two. And this is a person who is as nerdy as I am. Yeah. Um, and so. I, for the hope of the game and how it is now, I hope they're separated. Uh, for me personally, I think it's beneficial to me, unfortunately, even though I don't like where the pro game stands because I'm diving into more. I think golf is more desperate for the stories I'm telling yeah, uh, right. than ever. So I think yeah. personally it's probably beneficial to me. Yeah. I don't, don't shout it from the rooftops, but. COVID wasn't a bad thing for a podcast studio business either. I'll give you the tip. <laughs> Just between, between you and I. Professional golf feels to me like it needs to triage. It's one thing to not be growing your number of fans outside of the existing fan base. And I, like you, know quite a few people who've maybe not been that deep into golf but were regular golf watchers who've had the same mm-hmm. and they've turned away. When you start to lose your existing fans, yeah. and I don't know that the PGA Tour have seen this Properly, when you start to lose existing fans, that's a sport that's in real trouble. You go from a hardcore fan who watches four days a week, four different tours, to someone who watches the majors only, that's huge. And that's professional golf's in real trouble if that keeps being the case. Yeah, I, I've compared it often. I don't know how how, how Australia covers or, or portrays or looks at open wheel racing in the United States, but open wheel racing in the United States was – thriving uh 25 years ago and cart and irl uh split up as the pga tour has uh with live and open wheel racing has never recovered never uh and the popularity outside of one race a year is almost zero in the united states um and i'm afraid i hope i'm wrong Hmm. but i'm afraid that's where we're going yeah it did and of course that opened the market up for formula one to come in you know, Formula One is one of the few yeah. sports in the world that was global but didn't really have an American presence. Voila, drive to survive, manipulate the media, the Netflix special, yeah. present the story and the narrative in the right way, and America genuinely got interested in F1. And now you I mean, you see it in your own golf Twitter feed. There's people talking about F1 this and F1 that and Lewis yeah. Hamilton this. So it sort of can be done, which is what Full Swing didn't achieve, isn't it? It's because you're already in America. Yeah. <laughs> the dynamics were different. And, and I always say this about full swing round. I thought it was fine. Mm. I, I thought it was entertaining. What? I, yeah. Two two things. Drive to survive. You can lose your job and you can die. Mm. That makes for entertainment. <laughs> That's right. I'm all in on this. Give, and, me a, give me a split screen. And, I'm watching both of these. <laughs> in golf, you can't. the players they covered can't lose their job and they can't die. Can't. <laughs> so, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the, I don't know what the pull is. It's a bunch of rich white guys. It's the interesting it thing about live as a concept, isn't it? Is that you only want to watch the best of the best all the time. The supporting cast, the underdogs that you write about, we underplay the importance of them in the bigger narrative that allows Tiger to be Tiger. Tiger can't be Tiger without Mark right. Baldwin or a thousand Mark 100%. Baldwins. So, yeah. yeah. So that, that as a concept. It may be that golf's different. Golf's so different to so many other things in so many ways. It's possible that it could be the outlier where that is the model that will work the best, but it doesn't feel like it to me. The closed shop of the set names of the potential for boredom and players go off form and all those sorts of things. I'm not sure about the concept broadly, leaving live aside, whether the concept broadly makes any sense. But anyway... um, Man, I've already. I've just realised how much of your time I've already taken, which was about no, the limit. I'm I said, fine. This has been. This has been awesome. I hope they. I, I try. My goal with these conversations is for them to be a bit different. Now, it's not for everybody, so the audience is not as big as some other podcasts that talk about. So, 
But if you're wired that way, a bit like what you do, there is an audience for it, perhaps smaller. But if they find you, they're very loyal. We've got a good loyal audience for the for the. And this is the sort of uh, stuff we talk about. Before I let you go, tell people where they can find you and what they will find when they find you, because I can't keep up with the amount of content that you're creating. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, MondayQ.com, MondayQ Twitter, uh, MondayQ Info on Twitter uh, and Instagram. Uh, I cover the minor leagues of sports, uh, I mean of golf, uh, from the smallest mini tour you've never heard to the Corn Ferry Tour, LPGA, Epson Tour. Um, I've seen you post about, about results family. in pro-ams in Australia. I've seen you <laughs> one-day oh. pro-ams in oh, regional yeah. Australia. You've posted as like, well, I oh, couldn't 100%. have found that score if you'd asked me. <laughs> I don't know where you got it. The what? good news, Rod, the good news is about growing is I don't have to look at those as much. People just send, send them, them to, to me, you. That's right. right. Like, yes. Like, I used to have – 37 tabs open. I was going to say, right? what's your like, bookmark oh, list look like? <laughs> It'd have to be alphabetically. Yeah, yeah. I open. mean, it's still, it's still large. Yeah. I go, I go to them often, but often like I get sent like, Ryan, have you seen this or seen that or seen this crazy scorecard? So, uh, it's been easier, but yeah, that's what I do is cover the, the journey to the top of a sport. Yeah. Whether, or whether not successful or not, that's right. You get close and not get there. There's, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's the advantage I have, Rod, is uh, I say this all the time. I just did it on my own personal. I played in this Alpina City Open. I think it's relatable to a lot of people. There is no bad content. I played like crap. <laughs> people can relate to that. Absolutely. Uh, when the, I go to – yeah. When the, I go to a Monday qualifier and I'm going to follow A and B player, it doesn't matter. They If they shoot 63 and get in, great. If they shoot 75 and crap the bed – and are out $2,500, I want to talk to them too because that is pro golf. 98% of the golfers that leave a Monday qualifier are going to feel just like that guy or girl. And so that's who I want to talk to too. I can. It's the nice thing about being uh, the only one covering full-time niches. I control the narrative from the standpoint of the story is the story. I mean, I know that's an easy line to say, but for me it's really the case. Like if – a guy from Golf Digest says, I'm all in on Tommy Fleetwood. I think he's going to win the Open Championship this year, and he shoots 76-76 to miss the cut. That's not really a story no. because Tommy Fleetwood's going to be back next year. He's wealthy, all those things. So uh, if my guy qualifies for the Open Championship and he spends the last $4,000 on his credit card to get there, no matter what he does, it's a great story. Yeah. That's right. There's there's no there's no bad endings in terms of the story. There are bad endings yeah. for him, but they're not too bad endings in terms, yes, exactly. in terms of the story. It's a it's it's fascinating what you do. That the hairball of the relationships between the readers and the viewers and the listeners and the sponsors and you and you not having planned for any of this and trying to navigate it all in it's almost a little soap opera in itself. And it's uh, if anybody doesn't follow Ryan on Twitter, they really should. It is fantastic stuff. And you you're very good with the trolls too. I think you handle them. <laughs> so, and you get your fair share. So, uh, yes, if you're interested in really interesting stories about people, Ryan's, uh, Ryan's the man to follow in golf. It's been fabulous to catch up again today, Ryan. It's been too long since we spoke, but I really enjoyed doing it officially Same. with microphones in hand. Thanks for your time today. Same. Now, I know there was probably too much media discussion and not enough golf talk in all of that, but I found the conversation compelling, and I hope that you did too. Well, that's it for episode 124 of the podcast, but make sure to tune in again next time when we continue trying to find the answer to that eternal question, what is the thing about golf? Golf.